One of the most frequent concerns I hear from youth workers regarding the influence of today's youth culture relates to the growing involvement of kids and families in youth sports. These days, families are spending more time and more money on youth sports, sometimes pulling kids out of opportunities for spiritual growth. Even those of us who don't play but who watch college and pro sports can easily develop idolatrous habits. What is it that's driving our obsession with sports? Can we engage with sport in healthy ways that bring glory to God? And how can we best minister to kids and families in our sports-obsessed world? Stick with us as we talk about integrating faith into the world of sport with Dr. Tim Sedgel, a college athletic director, on this episode of Youth Culture Matters. From the Center for Parent Youth Understanding, this is Youth Culture Matters. If you're a parent, youth worker, educator, counselor, grandparent, or anyone else who cares about kids, we're glad you've joined us for this practical, informative, and hope-filled podcast. This is a place where together we talk and think Christianly about the rapidly changing world of today's children, teens, and young adults. Well, everybody, here we are in the middle of the summertime, and it is sports time, right? We're thinking a lot about, uh, for me anyway, thinking a lot about uh, baseball, and this is usually the time of year, every year, when I really go into a deep depression over my Philadelphia Phillies and just how horrible they become after thinking three, four months ago, this year. This year is going to be it, but... Uh, I've always loved sports, and I'm a big Philadelphia sports fan, as Chris Wagner knows. Uh, Chris, unfortunately, is a Yankees fan. And, Chris, you actually, your your fandom is, uh, it's really, it's out there because you're all over the place. You don't, you don't, you haven't chosen one place to settle, right? I mean, you're not geographic. You're sort of schizophrenic about this. Uh, that's only true to a certain standpoint. Um, so I am a Yankees fan, yes, which is the state of New York. I'm a yes. Buffalo Bills fan, and you do recall Buffalo. The Buffalo Bills are the only team that plays in the state of New York, so they are New York's team. Uh, the Giants and the Jets, neither of them actually play in the state of New York, so I, I don't give them any light of day. Um, and then I do happen to be a Penguins fan. That's the outlier. Right, Pittsburgh Penguins, yeah. yeah. Well, I would, you know, I mean, it's it's cities. It's cities. I know you're trying to justify this by states, but, um, yeah, I'm sure is this expensive. What about basketball? Are you in the I'm, basketball? Oh, yeah, side? Knicks fan. New, Knicks. Okay, all right, yep. so you're a Knicks fan. And then your soccer team. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll leave that for – We'll leave that for later, your football team. Well, it's, you know, the sports is a big deal, and, and we really do get into it. And, you know, I, I think about this a lot because as having been a youth pastor and then thinking a lot about discipleship and, you know, how does faith intersect sport. When I graduated from college and I went into my first youth ministry position, the church I was at, we had a church league basketball team and we had a church league softball team. And I played on both. And it was interesting to me to see what it means to be a player on a church league team. You know, what, what, what makes that Christian? And I, I came away with a conclusion after all those years of playing on those teams. And I've seen this elsewhere as well. And when I talk about it, people giggle and laugh because they know it to be, it's true. But it's a sad truth is that we, we somehow think that we're different when we play sports as Christians in church leagues because we pray at the beginning. And we pray at the end, but it doesn't matter a hill of beans how we play in between the opening and the closing prayer. And so I've often said that church league softball, church league basketball are the closest thing to hell on earth that anyone can ever experience just because it's so doggone cutthroat. And I, I, I've seen it and, and I've lamented it because somehow, you know, when I was involved in I was like, there's something better than this. We're just, we're just missing the mark here. And that's why we're going to have this conversation today because— as I've gotten older, sports has become uh, much more extensive, much more pervasive. The level at which our kids are playing is uh, beyond anything imaginable. When I was in high school and we would have practice, there wasn't a parent who showed up to watch a practice. And, and some parents never showed up to watch the games. But in today's world, we live, eat, breathe. We sometimes as parents live vicariously 
through our kids. We're going to get to talk about that because I know I've heard a lot from youth workers about that, and parents have been trying to figure out, you know, how do we navigate this? You know, do, uh, my kids, should they be playing every weekend and traveling all up and down the East Coast or where, wherever it is that we live? So we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but But sports has just become – even more of an idol than it ever was. And, and so we want to talk about how do we navigate sports as believers. And so today, it's, uh, I'm pretty excited to bring uh, Tim Sedgel in to talk to us. And, and I first encountered Tim, uh, not personally, but in a magazine article in By Faith Magazine. And this would have been back uh, in December. And he had uh, done an article, it was an interview with Andrew Shaughnessy about integrating sports and faith uh, in conversation with Tim Sedgel, and we're going to have that conversation today because I think it's one that's really, really necessary. This is such a big part uh, of our lives, and um, so Tim, welcome. Thanks for joining us, and you're coming to us from you're in. I I, I never know what to call it because they changed the name of the place where you're at, which is really interesting. Are you aware of that? At one point, it used to be Lookout Mountain, Georgia, that or then it was Lookout Mountain, Tennessee. Then it was what is it now? So look at Mountain, Georgia. Okay. Yeah, Mountain, Georgia. Um, but it's a fun fact. So um, because it is, uh, we're removed from the city of Chattanooga, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and there's a little bit more of a rural feel. And the closest post office is a mile away, but it's in Tennessee. But in order for Tennessee to be able to deliver the mail to the college, this was back in the 80s and earlier, it had to have a Tennessee address. So a lot of the, our old books in the library say, look, I'm out in Tennessee, but we've always been uh, Georgia through and through. Okay. And you're at Covenant College. Tell us a little bit about Covenant College. Yeah. So Covenant College is um, located on top of Lookout Mountain, Georgia. So if you Google it, the pictures actually are a reality. Um, it's a beautiful spot. It is a Christian college. So we're um, uh, very tightly, tightly connected to the Presbyterian Church in America, the PCA, and so um, governed by them, which has been a phenomenal relationship. Um, and when you look at um, the college's outcomes, they've had some pretty phenomenal outcomes. So um, we are ranked in the top four Christian colleges in the country. 95% um, of alumni report still being involved in a church in a, on a weekly basis or more. And then 93% um, of our graduates get into the top or second choice for graduate school if they choose to attend. And so the work that the faculty are doing here on campus has been um, really incredible in the landscape of Christian higher ed, where people are getting a phenomenal education, but also um, really developing in the relationship with the Lord here, um, which is our passion in athletics as well. Yeah, and your position there is your director of athletics and obviously very concerned about integrating faith into all of life. Talk talk a bit about that, how that plays into, you know, you're not in the, you're not in the classroom per se in terms of spending most of your time, uh, but certainly you're teaching students and student athletes uh, what it means to be a Christian athlete far beyond praying before or after a game. Yeah, so when you look at um, the landscape of Christian colleges or even really our culture's approach to sports and faith, there's been um, two different approaches. And one is, hey, we're really concerned about the discipleship side. And we really want to make a cognizant, intentional investment in that. Um, but oftentimes when that happens, we're not doing a great job pursuing excellence or using the gifts, talents, and abilities that God has given people. Um, so if we win, okay, that's great, whatever. But we're really growing in Jesus. Awesome. On the flip side, you see the opposite approach. You see hey, as us as believers, we're called to um, use our talents and not to bury them. And so um, we're going to pursue winning. And, and hey, if we can disciple along the way, then, then that's great. But if not, there's chapel on campus, and I'm sure the kids get it there. And I think both of those examples fall short. Um, I don't think that's what we're called to do. And so at Covenant, we look at discipleship is definitely the number one priority. So we want to see young men and women grow in their relationship with Christ as a result of being a student athlete here. But we also believe that we have talented coaches, phenomenal student athletes, and both of them are called, like I mentioned, to use those gifts, talents, and abilities that God has given them to pursue excellence in the classroom, also on the court. So we don't believe that pursuing winning is wrong. Um, we believe that that's um, really a manifestation of, of investing in the gifts that God has given. We're just not getting those things out of order, um, but we pursue them both um, at a really high level. Mm. 
Now, you know, just a just to sidetrack here a minute. I know you mentioned the PCA, the Presbyterian Church in America, which uh, Lisa and I were were members of that denomination. And this week, they're actually as we're recording this, they're actually getting ready to have a gathering in St. Louis. That's our annual gathering. It's called General Assembly uh, in the Presbyterian Church. And you are actually traveling there to speak about this very issue. Uh, talk a little bit about that, because obviously, you know, everything you just said indicates to me that, that this is not only a passion of yours, but it should be a passion of ours as well as we live in this culture and integrate faith into all of life. So what exactly will you be doing there and who will you be addressing? Yeah, so I'm excited to go to GA. Um, heading out um, here in a couple of days and we'll uh, speak on Thursday morning. So for them, um, we're diving into the same topic, youth sports. And so I'm gonna, um, it's gonna be leaders in the church, pastors, other um, ruling and teaching elders in the PCA. And, and I think this is an issue that our, our church really needs to step into. Um, it's a space that we've kind of avoided other than maybe we'll have a youth group party for the Super Bowl or something like that. Um, but then you see a lot of things that happen in the Super Bowl that don't align with our faith, right? Um, and even on a more practical level, the youth sports piece that a high percentage of our congregations are involved in um, oftentimes can be countercultural to what we're learning in church, but we're not equipping our membership with a way to, to frame that, to think through it, or to even challenge it. We kind of blindly accept um, the American culture approach to it. So I'm going to talk at General Assembly about first, um, athletics is a legitimate human endeavor, right? So if you look at references in the Bible, we have Acts 20 and 1 Corinthians 9, um, First and Second Timothy talks about it a few different times. And so there's some affirmation that it is okay for Christians to engage in athletics because um, the Bible is using that imagery. If there was um, a better imagery to use or a different imagery to use, then they would have gone that route. So, okay, so it's all right that we're engaging in this. But then in Romans 12, we're challenged, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. So in order not to be conformed to the pattern of this world, we have to know what that pattern is. And that pattern influences youth sports. And so we have to take a deep dive to unpack, okay, where does sin creep into youth sports? Where does that challenge our faith? Where does that not align with our faith? Identify it and deal with it. And I think in youth sports and all the way up to college sports, like we do here at Covenant, there are some very real discipleship opportunities, just the relationship side of it. We can dive into that more as we go along. Um, but if you're not intentional about those things, then it's, it's not just going to happen magically. Yeah. I, you know, as I'm thinking about you talking to pastors, you know, which in the PCA we call them teaching elders, and then also our leaders, the the ruling elders, you know, like a church board, uh, some would be more familiar with that. I'm thinking about <clears throat> the concerns that they have that would necessitate a conversation like this. So over the years, uh, Chris Wagner and I here in our work in CPYU and others, you know, when we travel and we're working with youth pastors, we hear a lot of growing surging level of lament, I would say, uh, and discouragement at the fact that youth sports has become more and more of an idol and seems to be taking more and more of our time, more and more of our effort, more and more of our money, and not only taking that, but taking kids away from opportunities to grow. What are some of the concerns that you've heard uh, from pastors and, and other church leaders about youth sports that would necessitate your going to General Assembly to address these folks and help them help them navigate these issues. Yeah, and you just, well, you hit on the two primary pieces. It's the time and the financial commitment, right? Um, so if we're going to put a lot of time and money into something, then we need to have a really clear idea of what the outcome is for our child. And oftentimes we'll get caught up in, um, we want our child, he has pro potential or she has the ability to be a D1 student athlete. And so let's evaluate that. When we look at high school seniors today, um, the likelihood that they'll play at any level of NCAA, division one, two, or three, is about 8% at the highest, depending on the sport. So high school seniors have an 8% chance to actually play in college. And then, and these are high school seniors that are already participating at the varsity level. 
And then when you look up of that 8% that actually plays at any level of college sport, um, depending on the sport that you want to go pro in, it's about a three to 4% chance that you'll actually go pro and, and the highest percentages in baseball because um, they have a million rounds of the draft, right? So if you look at that statistically, um, so I have a young son and, and statistically, he is not likely to get a full scholarship to college. And, and those that do get division one scholarships, the average division one scholarship right now is $13,000 versus a tuition of about $45,000. So even if you do get that coveted D1 scholarship, it's not going to fund everything. Um, but we see all these stories of men's basketball and football players that get those full rides. And that is such a small percentage and so unlikely. So we have this huge financial investment, this huge time investment, into something that statistically um, is not going to work out in our favor. So then the question is, well, why are we investing the way we do? And is this the way that Christ would call us to invest? Um, does Christ care about your son playing division one, getting a full scholarship? Does he care about your daughter being a professional athlete? Um, and I think he does at some level, but what Christ is very clear about in the scriptures is he cares deeply about us being more conformed to the image of his son. And so if we're spending this amount of time in this, are sports a tool that are conforming our children to be more like Jesus or are they not? And so often they're not because it just does not align with everything that's involved. Mm. I, I think back to when I was coaching baseball and I'm thinking they were probably 11 to 12 year old boys at the time, and I would always meet with the parents. And, you know, after you do this a few years, you get wiser about what you need to say in that initial meeting to derail the conversations and the complaints that you know are going to be coming down the road. I actually had uh, one time after the final game of a season, uh, I was up in the parking lot. It was a gravel parking lot. I was saying goodbye to all the boys and their parents. And one dad was so mad about the issue of playing time and everybody got to play everybody got to play I mean that was not that that was the philosophy I used that he spun his wheels and ripped out in the gravel and was shooting gravel at me as he drove out and I just thought okay well that was interesting uh so so you have that you know you, you you've got this on the part of the parents and like you said you know what are the chances I remember with that team in the beginning, when I was meeting with the parents after several weeks of practice prior to the time that the season started, I said to them, I, I don't think, I really don't believe that any of the boys that we have on this team are going to be professional baseball players. And, and then I, I said, except for my son, of course. Um, no, I didn't say that. But not, you know, none of these boys are going to be professional baseball players. And, I mean, that was just being realistic. And none of them turned out to be professional baseball players. In fact, none of them, many of them did not play in high school. And, and you know, none of them went on beyond high school to, to even play. So I, I like what you're saying there. But why do we, why do we get so locked in to this narrative that, okay, well, you know, Tim said there's a three to four percent chance. That's my boy. That's my girl. You know, what is it that keeps us? I, I mean, have you thought about that at all? Or, you know, what is driving us to, to think that, you know, my kid's going to be the one? Yeah. And we all think our kids are phenomenal, right? There's no question about that. But the, the question we need to evaluate is, um, obviously, God created creation to be perfect all within his will, but then the fall occurred, right? And so we go back to Romans 12, understanding what things um, have been conformed to the pattern of this world. So we have to evaluate in the context of sport. So we're tempted so often, like in many things in life, to find our identity in what we produce, the way that we perform. And so you look at, um, you know, the third grader in gym class, that strikes out in kickball for the third time in a row and he goes in the corner and he's crying, right? Um, well, he actually has the same worldview as many professional athletes. And that is, I am what I produce, I am what I do. Finding their identity in, God loves me more if I bat 400, God loves me more if I have a 4.0, um, God looks at my family better if my kid gets a division one scholarship. Um, and those things are not true. They just don't align with what scripture tells us. And so we need to evaluate our own heart to say, okay, where 
am I looking at things in a way that doesn't align with scripture, particularly in new sports? If I'm going to be traveling, if I'm going to be spending this money on it, if it's going to, if it's going to challenge Wednesday night youth group, or maybe even Sunday morning church or whatever it is, um, is this an investment in my family that's going to help us um, really grow in our faith? And there are ways that can happen, or do we have our priorities just out of line? And so often in the church, we have our priorities out of line. Mm, mm. Yeah, I really like this. I think as you're talking about kickball and someone striking out in kickball, I won't say how I know this, but boy, when you go after a ball in kickball and you miss it, it hurts. I mean, that is, <laughs> that can be the greatest pain in sports. And we, we actually, my grandkids are getting old enough now that I bought a uh, one of those rubber playground balls, you know, that old classic uh, playground balls and some bases that we throw down in the backyard and we had a kickball game a few weeks ago and uh, it was interesting that as we're trying to teach the little ones how to kick and play kickball or run the bases a couple of the big ones actually missed the ball and it was hard to play because we were all laughing so hard it was a lot of fun but yeah and that's what sports should be so listen this is a great conversation we're going to come back and after the break and I want to talk to Tim about some doctoral research that he did uh, what sparked that and what came out of that because there's some very interesting and important and helpful findings and uh, we're going to talk as well about you know how do we navigate this as parents and how do we navigate this as youth workers so stick with us and we'll be right back uh, with more youth culture matters Hey, youth workers, I want to let you know about a podcast resource we've recently launched here at CPYU that's just for you. Our brand new The Word in Youth Ministry podcast is a podcast by youth workers and for youth workers that will help you build and improve your ability to teach the Bible and theology to your students. There is not a more important discipleship task than correctly teaching the truths of God's Word to the kids we've been called to lead. We want them to hear the biblical narrative over and above the constant 24-7 noise of the cultural narrative. So check out the Word in Youth Ministry podcast. You can find it at cpyu.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, welcome back, everybody, to Youth Culture Matters. We are having a conversation with Tim Sedgel, who is the athletic director at Covenant College uh, in Lookout Mountain. And he's done some some great work and, and some good thinking that is really helpful to all of us as we think about what it means to integrate our faith into sport. And, and I would say, you know, even if you don't play, uh, you have kids who play, you may be a coach, uh, you may just be a spectator, as many of us are. Our Christian faith has a lot to say about this. I love the great quote from Abraham Kuyper about integration of faith into all of life, that there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. And that includes every aspect of sport. And, Tim, you did some doctoral work, and I was reading about this, that your, your central question that you went to attack in your doctoral work was, was this— does athletic does athletic participation influence faith development? What did you discover in answer to that quest and that question? Yeah, so I um, was down there at the University of Alabama, so got to give the obligatory roll tide um, where I did that work. We just lost half of our Alabama audience right now, so that's... <laughs> Sorry, my apologies to all the Auburn fans. I'm going to be with some Alabama and Auburn people next week. So, yeah. Our faith is bigger than our sports affiliation. That's what we're talking about. There you go. So um, when I was down there, I was excited they let me jump into that topic. Um, And when I look, so I was the AD at Covenant at the time. um, And when I was looking across the country, you know, you look at Christian high schools, um, Christian colleges, or even our churches. And we talk about we want people to grow in their faith as a result of, um, competing in sports at our institution or our school, but there was no research that supported or that actually dived into finding out, does that actually happen? So we have this in our mission statement and um, all these types of things, but does it actually happen um, other than some nice anecdotal stories that we can tell at board meetings or whatever? So um, I did my research on exploring this. So James Fowler, for the nerds that are listening, is a 
a researcher um, that used to be at Emory, and he has um, a way to, to evaluate faith development over the course of time. And so um, took that survey instrument and interviewed our student athletes um, at Covenant. And I wanted to find out, do we actually do what we say that we do? And if we don't, then let's figure out why. Um, and if we do, well, we need to figure out what actually contributes to that. So we found some pretty cool things out. For the most part, um, it actually happens, which is exciting. Um, and what we learned through that is that the number one influencer in college athletics was relationships. And so this would play out even in the U sport front with who's coaching your child. Um, so if there was a positive relationship there, it uh, was able to turn into a discipleship relationship quickly. So um, it's the same idea, Walt, like if I don't know you very well and you want to you see something in my life that doesn't align with who I say that I am as a Christian um, and you want to talk to me about it, I might not be that receptive if, if we don't have a great relationship. But if I know Chris really well, trust him and we've developed that relationship and, and we've been in battle through practice and those kind of things. And, and Chris wants to come alongside and say something to me about, hey, Tim, um, I'm not sure about this part of your life. Okay, well, let's have that conversation. And he's drawn, trying to draw me closer um, to Christ, which is the biblical motto, right? Jesus came alongside sinners, spent time with them, but in his goal of spending time with them was to draw them closer to him. And so that's what we see in sport as well. So what that means is, man, it is so important who's coaching our kids because they are framing their perspective on sport. They are framing their perspective on what is right and good to do in the context of competition, um, all of those kind of things. Now, as parents, we need to evaluate a lot more closely. Um, and it's not just that, okay, hey, he's a good guy from the community coach in this team. Man, this, that's a, a, a discipleship opportunity. So, um, man, maybe our parents need to step up and, and be coaches more often and use it as a way to disciple these youth sport programs um, and really impact our communities in positive ways. Yeah, I, uh, just a question on that, just to follow up as you're talking about this, what came to mind is having coached myself, watching all my kids play sports, um, and even up to the college level, you know, you, I, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying about relationships, and I'm thinking, okay, in, uh, in, in athletics, you have a relationship of authority, right? A coach over a team, a coach over individual players. And for a team to function well or for to an athlete to achieve at higher and higher levels, there has to be an openness to feedback, uh, constructive criticism, guidance, direction, do this, don't do that. You've got this bad habit or you need to improve on this. You're doing this well. And I'm thinking, you know, that that makes it sort of a, a fertile ground, I guess, for conversations about spiritual things that would actually – you know, maybe outside of the realm of athletics where there isn't that kind of relationship and there's more of a pushback on authority, which is certainly a mark of our culture right now. You know, who are you to tell me how to do anything? And that can be, I mean, that can happen in a family as well. And I know that can happen on a, on a team, but a, a player doesn't last, right, on a team if that's the attitude they have. So, is that is that sort of what you're talking about? I'm just trying to think. Like it, it just seems like to have that kind of relationship really makes the possibility of discipleship uh, happening in positive ways e even greater than than maybe if we don't have that kind of relationship. Does that make sense? Absolutely, and um, it, it it aligns with the way that we're approaching things here. I mean, and Billy Graham he said. A coach will impact more people in one year than the average person will in an entire lifetime. And that's just because of exactly what you're talking about, right? So um, there is much more opportunity to dive into those kind of things. And if I can show you as a player, if I'm the coach, um, that I care about you more than just being a player, that's a great breeding ground for a really positive relationship um, because I'm already open to, um, you're already open to hearing what I have to say. And we're going to spend a lot of time together um, through practices, through games. I'm going to have a lot of time to be able to demonstrate just my care for you, my care for you as a person, my care for your soul, and for you just growing um, in love for the sport. 
But if we're only worried about the performance of youth sport players who, like we talked about statistically, aren't playing in college, aren't playing professionally, um, man, then we're missing some really great opportunities there as believers. Yeah, yeah, this is, I, I, I like this. And I'm thinking about, you know, as you talk about this, uh, I, I read a book uh, a few years ago uh, by Jeffrey Marks called A Season of Life about Joe Ehrman and uh, Biff Podge and how they were really working through the football, how they coached football at the Gilman School, a private uh, boys school outside of Baltimore, uh, Spurman, Baltimore, how they were, it was really about winning. I mean, that was a big part of it, but it was about turning boys, making boys into men. And it was the very thing you're talking about and the relationships. It's a great book, by the way, uh, that, that I mentioned. I don't know if, if you've read that one, Tim, or not, but it's, it's excellent. I have, and I agree that that's a great one. Um, one of the ones that we um, like to make sure our coaches have read are Inside Out Coaching, and that's by Joe mm-hmm. Um, and he does a great job of just um, unpacking really the approach that we're talking about um, that's been really helpful on that front. Yeah. Besides individual relationships that you just talked about, what else have yep. you discovered or what else did you discover through your research? Yeah. So um, that was the first thing. There's four things total. So the second one um, after individual relationships was finding identity in Christ versus identity in sport. And that's a struggle that a lot of us have, right? Am I finding my identity in my job more than I am? in Christ or my identity in my family. And so what we've seen is students coming into college really have not done um, or been given the opportunity to find their identity in Christ over everything. So they really find their identity in sport. So if I'm in in a situation where we've seen student athlete is in um, the conference championship game and it goes into penalty kicks, misses the penalty kick, is that going to crush you? for the rest of your time here on our campus? Or is that gonna be an opportunity to say, you know what, this is really hard and and I'm having great difficulty with this, but I know my king is bigger than this kick. Um, And that's a hard thing to be able to do, but that's something that our coaches really work on with our student athletes of God, his love is so much bigger than one performance, one game, one season. You need to rest in the fact that God has chosen you, loved you, redeemed you. And so play in that freedom. Don't play in if I don't perform, that's devaluing me some way in light of the kingdom. To the same end, our coaches can't coach that if a player doesn't perform, that they're devalued or that player's devalued. And so it it works all the way around. So that's the second point. Can I say something uh, just to, just to clarify on that? that uh, as you talk about that, I think about professional sports and even uh, a higher level college sports and just the issue of spectating, that it's that when you, you see an athlete, uh, you know, fail to complete a play or, you know, in the example you used or they miss a shot, I'm thinking I watched the um, uh, NCAA Division One lacrosse championship a few weeks ago Maryland and Virginia. Maryland comes back with, uh, I think, about eight or nine seconds left. They win a faceoff. They're down by one, and their faceoff guy gets the ball, and he goes straight to the goal, and it's almost almost unimpeded, and he has a, a almost a wide-open shot, and he misses as, as time expires and the game's over, and Virginia wins, Maryland loses. And just how the cameras went you know, to that young man, and you're watching that, you're just feeling so bad for them now – That's just one example. But what about the people watching that who, you know, as spectators, don't we have to be aware of where we place our identity? Because, you know, I think about uh, (laughs) – I know you're a Cubs fan. You mentioned that to us beforehand. But we've talked on here before about Bart – what was his name? Bart Bartman or Steve Steve Bartman? Oh, Steve Bartman, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, you know, I mean, people wanted to kill him. And, Mm -hmm. you know, he's getting death threats. If you're not familiar with the story, go and Google it. But the guy – you know, interfered, I guess, basically very innocently with a foul ball and, and people were ready. It, it, you know, they felt it, it changed the outcome of the game. They saw the game going differently if he didn't do that, which it could have, obviously. But uh, this is a problem. This identity problem is not just a problem for athletes. It may even be a bigger problem sometimes for spectators because you see athletes walk away and go, look, I'm just going to put this behind me and move on to tomorrow. 
Absolutely. You know, the pastor at the church that I go to, he's a, a big Georgia fan, and well, I still love him. He uh, <laughs> tells his kids that our Saturday is not going to be dictated, or how much we enjoy our Saturday is not going to be dictated based on the performance of 18 to 22-year-old men. And now it's something that we can have fun, we can watch, but regardless of what happens, um, that's a fun escape, but it's not going to dictate um, our feelings for the rest of the day or our thoughts for the rest of the day. Um, Because again, Christ is bigger than those things. And so um, when Alabama loses, which obviously happens very rarely, but when they do, um, that's something that we just, okay, Alabama lost to Clemson. We're moving on. That was a fun season. Um, But I can't, you know, we, we can't be judging the quarterback or the kicker or whatever. And those things are cultivated in youth sports, right? So you talk about Um, playing church uh, basketball or church softball early on in your career. And the way that we're navigating those things um, really becomes important. And so to your point, it's not just praying before and after. um, It's what happens between the lines. And so, so often you see post-game interviews that will have college athletes or professional athletes, and they're they're interviewing the winner. And they say, you know, I thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, But that's only ever after they win. And when you look at the way that they played the game, did they actually play the game in a way that honors Christ? Or did they do some things in the context of that game that maybe don't align with the faith that they're claiming? And what happens when they interview the loser? Well, we're never talking about our faith, right? Because God definitely couldn't be involved in losing. So there's just a disconnect throughout all of that um, that shows, man, we don't really have a good Christian philosophy of sport that has applied to the lives of believers that are engaged in sport. Mm-hmm. This is good. So uh, relationships, uh, identity formation was the second thing you mentioned. There were there were four? Yep. So number three is um, really adverse experiences. And so um, a couple examples that came up in my research is we had a, a baseball player that was a major league uh, prospect here at Covenant, and he tore his rotator cuff um, at, in his junior year and um, had some teams that said, if you're still available at X position, we're going to draft you. And so um, he was transparent going into the draft process, disclosed the injury, which a lot of prospects don't, and he didn't get drafted. So came back to school senior year. Um, but when I was talking with him, he just talked a lot about that really forced me to work through my identity. Am I, was my identity in baseball? Yeah, it was, but I didn't even realize it until I thought that was being taken away. So he came back um, his senior year and just played in the freedom of my identity is no longer in baseball, performed really well, um, and now is a, a great um, professional baseball career and still playing today. So um, other folks had dealt with some adversity in their own family life. Um, we had um, one student out there that lost a parent and that just really um, forced her to prioritize things in life. And, and she had struggled too with finding identity in sport and then dealing with the adverse experience, which obviously we wouldn't wish on anybody. Um, but God uses an opportunity for her to say, hey, let's focus on the most important thing um, and that frame that. So obviously we hope that we can get to that point um, without having to go through that adversity. But there are times um, like in the life of Joseph, that God can use adversity to really help us grow in our faith. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's really interesting here is it, 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 two of the things that you've talked about coming out of your research, uh, the adverse experiences, which you just mentioned, and then before that identity, those are those are two areas that we've been saying for years here at CPYU. Uh, these are huge in the culture right now. Kids are asking questions about these things, and we need to teach on this, right? Find your identity in Christ, because especially with social media, uh, now we have all this, these new opportunities to seek our identity elsewhere. And then also, uh, you know, just the whole idea of suffering, teaching a theology of suffering, that you don't just come to faith and everything is great. So um, yeah, I'll just, before we take a break, I just need, I want to tell you one story about, because you talked about my career as if I'm actually an athlete. Chris was laughing, and I sort of chuckled inside as well. Uh, I will tell you about my basketball career. I was never a good basketball player. Um, I played basketball like it was football, but the first organized basketball team I was on, uh, you'll appreciate this, Tim, was actually, and I think this is documented, the worst uh, basketball team in the history of basketball. And I say that because we were in a church league outside of Philadelphia, and my dad was the pastor. He decided he wanted to give the boys 
in the junior high group an opportunity to play basketball. So he enters us, get, gets a coach from a local Christian school. He, this guy's going to coach us. And he enters us in this basketball league. Now, we're all junior hires. We're seventh and eighth grade. The basketball league he puts us in is a high school league. We, so we're junior hires at the time, no middle school, right? We're junior hires playing against high school kids who were athletes, by the way, many of them basketball players. We never scored more than 12 points in a game, and this was over the course of two years. We did that, we did that once, scored 12 points. And no team ever scored less than 100 points against us. And so it got to the point where people would come to these games, <laughs> sit in the stands just because they heard about this, this ridiculous thing going on. And whenever we would score, if somebody from our team just like, you know, and it was basically just throw it up, right? And you're hoping it, it's going near the basket and it's going to go in because you're just getting killed. And when we would score, the whole place would just go ballistic, including all of the fans for the other team. They would stand up and they would cheer. So uh, worst basketball team ever. And, you know, I'm embarrassed to say this, but just in an effort to uh, assuage our pain that year, the adverse experience, uh, we got a trophy. And I still have that trophy. And it was basically uh, a piece of marble. Chris, you've seen it. It's a piece of marble about three quarters of an inch thick with a basketball player on top. It's not like this. It's like, you know, four inches high. That was our trophy. So that was probably the first participation trophy. You know, you get a medal, right? For everybody gets a medal. Everybody gets a trophy. But so I know ad, I know adversity a little bit. This is good. Hey, we're going to come back. We're going to hit that uh, fourth item that Tim discovered in his research. And then I have a few more questions of, of a more practical nature that would be helpful for youth workers and for parents and, and, and students who are playing as we navigate this, this issue of youth sports and Christian faith. Stay with us. Tens of thousands of kids have been trained by their parents and youth workers to think Christianly about music and media with our How to Use Your Head to Guard Your Heart 3D Guide to Making Wise Media Choices. This easy-to-use teaching tool needs to be in your youth ministry toolbox if you desire to teach your students to integrate their faith into all of life. Jesus calls us to follow Him, and that includes following Him into the six to nine hours a day of screen time that shape and mold the beliefs and behaviors of our kids. To learn more about our 3D Media Evaluation Guide and to order a copy for every member of your youth group, go to our website at cpyu.org teach your kids to engage with media to the glory of God. So Tim, in your doctoral research, you were trying to find an answer to this one central question. Does athletic participation influence faith development? You've given us three results of your research. You have a fourth here that I'm interested in hearing about. What was that? Yeah, so the fourth piece is the holistic environment. And so when you look at the environment that your student athlete or your child is in, um, that really makes an impact. So we've talked about, um, obviously, the athletic environment can make a very positive impact if conducted in the right way. That doesn't just happen naturally. And so um, people sometimes have this idea that um, athletics builds character. Well, the research says it doesn't. It depends on how it's done. Um, so that's a piece. And then when you look at um, the holistic environment, so for us, what our student athletes were saying is that they couldn't escape Christianity um, in a positive sense, right? So you're going into the classroom and you're hearing it there. They're involved in a local body of believers. They're hearing it there in the dorm rooms. They're hearing it there. And then obviously in athletics too. So it's really challenging you to be thinking about things from a Christian perspective. And so from a youth sports side of things, it's applicable there too. So what's the environment in home? How are you engaging in those types of things. I think about the Israelites where God asked them um, to have things on posts that would point back to their um, association with him and, and to continue telling their children the stories of how God had worked. And so the same thing applies to us now as the church is how are we integrating our faith at home? How are we um, integrating our faith in sport if that's a huge um, time commitment for us? And then um, what does our involvement look like with a local body of believers? How exposed are our kids to this? 
Um, if we're just sending our kids to church on Sunday morning, as long as they don't have a game and kind of check in the Christian box, um, the, the research would say, man, that, that's probably not enough to generate this holistic environment of faith development. And as a parent, that's probably something you need to evaluate to say, man, are there ways I could ramp this up as I really try to care well for the soul of my child? Mm. So, so let me ask a couple of questions on behalf of youth workers here. And this has been on my mind since we started our conversation that, you know, you're working, obviously, you're talking about what happens on a college, a Christian college campus where, you know, that, that concentrated lifestyle and you know that everything's integrated there. But let's say I've got kids in my youth group who, you know, they've been involved, they come from Christian homes, and as they start to go through high school and get more and more involved in youth sports, I know this happens at even younger ages now, they start to check out on a lot of the youth group activities and opportunities for spiritual growth because of practices and and travel and Sunday mornings and things like that. What would you say to a youth pastor about how to respond to that in the case of students who definitely have been given by God uh, athletic talent and ability? How would you in, advise them, you know, to navigate that relationship? Do we look at it as a, as a failure and just say, I'm done with that kid because they can't come on Wednesday nights to Bible study or you know, they're not there for youth group because they're at practice. How, how would you encourage a youth worker to navigate that? Yeah, so I'd say there'd be two pieces there. So one is, um, man, you still want to find a way to have that kid connected. And so what does that look like? Um, because we know that relationships are influential. And so we, if we can stay connected to a Christian community, um, that's going to positively impact our faith development. So um, what are ways that you can do that as a youth leader? Can you take that kid out to lunch? Can you meet him at school? Um, can you take the youth group one Wednesday night to watch him play? Or um, what strategies can, um, can you impact that kid with? And not that you're building the youth group around one talented athlete, but still tr trying to find ways to show that there's a love and a care and investment there. And then the second thing is we've talked about sport is a really great way um, to both engage in discipleship, but then also you can be a witness in that if we're pushing back against the cultural expectations in sport. And so um, when you look at the things that your kids are watching in youth group, um, usually every year, 40 ish of the top 50 programs that are viewed um, on TV are sport programs or athletic events at some level. So kids in youth group are watching this stuff. So spend some time talking about this in youth group and a Christian perspective on it, right? So even um, something as simple as, okay, let's evaluate how are we motivated in sport? Oftentimes it's pride, it's anger, it's winning over everything, it's performing out of fear, meeting expectations. When you get to the professional level money, um, even though that's creeping in at the college level too, but what does Christ say is the most effective motivator in the Christian life? We look at Matthew 22, it's love, love God and love neighbor. Um, and we dive into 1 Corinthians 13, 1. If I speak with the tongues of men or angels, but I do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a claim, uh, clanging symbol. So if I have great athletic ability um, and I speak in tongues of angels, but I'm not having love in my life for Christ and for others, um, then it's meaningless. And so let's dive into that Um at a youth sport level to frame um, our future generations to really look at sport as a great opportunity for the gospel. Mm, I like that. Let me give you another question on behalf of youth workers, and this one may be a little bit loaded, I don't know, but how would you advise a youth worker to handle competition or sport in the youth group setting? You know, I mean, games and things like that. And, and, you know, I lean into that a lot when I was in the local church doing youth ministry because I loved that stuff. And I thought it was just a fun way to get kids to engage with each other and to play. And it really hasn't been until I've gotten older and I've been able to look back that I realize I think I, I think I kind of eliminated a whole group of kids and put them in a rough situation. I mean, beyond adverse experience, some, something that they just hated because that, that wasn't in their wheelhouse. They would have preferred maybe to have a youth group science fair or something like that. I don't know. You know, how would you 
advise youth workers to handle competition in a in a good way yeah maybe some board games or something like that yeah i think um i i think you need to look at okay what's what's your mission in youth ministry right what do you ultimately want to cultivate and you want to see people become more like christ and the way that's often happening in youth ministries through relationships and so engaging in athletic competitions or kickball or whatever it is, I think is fine. It can be a lot of fun, but you want to do it with the goal of um, less emphasis on the competitive side of things and more, how do we develop relationships through this? And so are there creative ways we can split up teams or different games that um, people can still engage in without a ton of regard for athletic ability. Um, it takes a little bit more thought on the front end, but if we can do this to facilitate relationships, um, then I think that can be a really great thing. Mm. So as we wind down here, I have this question that uh, I've got a bunch of words after the question, right? I'm going to ask it four times to you, and it starts with, what difference does faith make? So the first one would be, what difference does faith make in playing? I know you've talked about this already, but just in, in a couple of sentences, give us, give us some nuggets here that we can take. You know, the best of Tim, you've got a captive audience. What difference does faith make in playing? I think it allows you to play free through the freedom of Christ who has set us free, right? So we don't have to... Um, have all of these other concerns that often other folks are burdened down with. Christ has set us free through the work of his son on the cross. And so we can pray, play for his glory. Um, on a more practical level, when you look at um, students, student athletes at the college level, they're faith affiliated. They actually um, graduate at higher rates because they have um, just a built-in coping mechanism, a, a way to uh, make it through those adverse experiences. And so there's a lot of practical um, positive things for people that um, have faith, but from the largest sense, man, we are bought and redeemed by Christ, and that can empower us as we make it through athletics and the other things that, that life brings our way. Okay, how about what difference does faith make in coaching? Because we have people who are coaching who are listening. Yeah, it needs to make a huge difference. Um, oftentimes, you have people that are Christian coaches that coach just the same way as what we see on ESPN and use the same words and all those kind of things. Um, but coaching... Um, much like ministry is a calling. And so to steward that calling, um, you are impacting lives in a really significant way, like, you know, Billy Graham um, alluded to in, in our earlier segment. And so are you going to use that as an opportunity to disciple young men or young women or both to become more like Christ as a result of playing for you, playing in your system, or is it going to be something that you use for your own glory? And the, uh, the model in our culture right now is to use it for your own glory um, and our winning record matters and, and all of those things. And, and I'm not saying that it doesn't, but I'm saying that, man, Christ has given us such a higher calling in the context of coaching that I think oftentimes we miss and we, we got to evaluate that. Mm. How about this? Uh, what difference does faith make in parenting athletes or parenting kids who are involved in youth sports? Yeah, I think parents just have to look at this um, from a Christian perspective. I think they can't just buy into um, this is the way the league is set up, so we're always going to miss church on Sunday, or this is the league, the way that um, things have to happen in order for our child to be successful. Um, we've had players that have, have come through here that have turned down opportunities in soccer to, to play on an ECNL team because it's going to cost too much travel, and, and they still came here where all Americans had phenomenal experiences, so it didn't hinder them from a soccer experience. Um, I've heard other stories of um, people that uh, were running um, AAU teams and wanted the child to play on Sunday and said, um, I know you're from a Christian family, we'll just come have a, a priest come and bless the court so that way you can play on Sunday and um, everything should be great, right? And that, that family took a stance and said, no, it's really important for us to be with our local body of believers on Sunday. Um, and that child ended up being um, the player of the year in Tennessee in their sport and uh, having a phenomenal career. Um, so not playing on Sunday didn't ruin them. And that's a choice for each family, obviously. Um, people interpret scripture differently there, but it's important that you at least step into that conversation and really decide um, what's God calling you to, what's the right decision from your for your family, and not just saying we're going all in with youth sports and we're just not gonna evaluate it or, or, or think that we can. Um, 
I'll just give a quick plug there. There's a, a couple good resources that are really helpful that will help parents unpack that. So CJ Mahaney has a book called Don't Waste Your Sports and the book's no bigger than my hand. Um, and it's just a really quick primer on framing sports from a Christian perspective and then asks some really um, driving questions at the end on youth sports, on, on whatever context of sport you're engaging in to really help parents think through it. That's good. All right. So here's the last one. But let, let me let me ask you a question first. This is this is just kind of get to know Tim a little bit. But, you you know, as a sports fan, as an AD, I know you like professional sports. Uh, just in your opinion, because uh, we're going to talk about spectating, what city has the worst fans? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> worst fans. Well, it depends on how you define worst, of course. Uh, now we're getting technical, okay. But um, you look at, uh, I think Morgantown really enjoys wins and losses probably equally with the burning couches and all that kind of thing. Um, I did do my master's degree at the University of Louisville, so of course Lexington has the worst fans um, in basketball. There's no, no question about that in my mind. Um, but I really think it's, um, you can say the same thing about Alabama football. And, yeah. and when you define worst, it's oftentimes people that have their identity wrapped up in the performance of their team. And when their team either does or does not perform at the level that they think they should, they act out in really negative ways. And so it really becomes a heart problem rather than a fan identification issue. Yeah. Boy, you, you really navigated that question in a, in a way different than I thought you would because you went down the college road. And I was, I was kind of hoping you let me throw it at you from a professional level with, you know, cities with multiple sports teams. And there's a method in my madness here because Chris is a fan of of some New York sports and, and uh -huh. I'm a fan of Philly sports. So I'm kind of hoping you'll you'll land on my side, but I'm afraid you <laughs> won't because most people don't. Right. You know, Philadelphia fans are the worst. They threw yeah, the snowballs at Santa Claus. Philadelphia and Pittsburgh fans both are, are very uh, passionate about um, uh, their team's success and failure. There's no question there. Um, I like Pittsburgh sports, though, because they use the same color for everything, so it's very convenient. Okay. I, and I, 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 I like the way, you know, I asked a question, you know, the worst, the worst fans, and you substituted with the word passionate. So I just want to point that out to people that that was a, a really diplomatic way of doing that. So, so here's my question. Then the last one is what difference, cause we're all spectators, right? What difference should faith make in our spectating? Yeah. So, um, it goes back to identity. Do I find my identity in New York sports in, um, Alabama football or in the Philadelphia 76ers um, should we trade Ben, trade Ben Simmons? Am I really mad at him? Cause he didn't perform in the playoffs. Right. And do those things captivate me, um, more than the things that God is calling me to. Right. So, um, I need to really evaluate that. Am I more excited about a 76ers win than I am about, um, the guy that I don't know at church that sits next to me, but he he uh, got baptized this weekend or whatever it is. Um, I think those are just really important things for us to to look through. Are we more excited about the things of this world than we are about the things of Christ? And if we are, then that's really important to identify. And then we got to work towards, okay, how do I need to fix that? Because um, Christ is constantly working. Christ is constantly calling us to be more like him and constantly identifying maybe areas of blindness to us. And so let's identify those and then, man, let's work through that together. Yeah, I, I like that. I, I remember someone saying to me, this was about 30 years ago, you know, you tell me who or what, who or what it is you daydream about and I'll tell you who or what your God is. And yeah. man, when I hear that, you know, I, I, ha I have to say that probably, you know, my daydreams that derail my thoughts away from, what they should be, and I'll just say specifically on a Sunday morning when I'm sitting in worship, is if I find myself thinking about my team and that game later in the day, boy, that is just, that's just a punch in the gut as I think back to that, and so, you know, really trying to navigate and overcome that, so good. I, I, I want to I remind our listeners before we end here that everything that we mentioned on this podcast, the books Tim's mentioned, uh, the resources that are out there. Chris Wagner will 
I'll put links to all those if you go to cpyu.org and you look at the player for this episode of the Youth Culture Matters podcast and just scroll down underneath the player, you'll find all those links. And I, I do want to ask Tim, are there any other websites? I mean, even you with social media, are there ways that folks can connect with you? Are there any other books that you would recommend that would be helpful here? Yeah, happy to connect with anyone of interest. Uh, my, my email is on the um, Covenant College Athletics website and then uh, on Twitter, it's at Sedgel Speaks. And then um, the last book that I think has just been really helpful for me and that I've um, used with our student athletes here on campus too, is Brian Smith wrote a book called The Assist. It's a gospel-centered guide to glorifying God through sports. Um, and it's it's a very, it's more expansive than the C.J. Mahaney one, which is just a tiny little um, primer. Um, but it, it's very practical. It really helps people think through their approach to sports and it really unpacks, hey, here are some ways um, in light of our faith that we can engage in sports in really positive ways. So can't say enough about Brian. He has a uh, his own website too that unpacks that stuff a little bit more as well um but he's done some phenomenal work in uh, this particular realm yeah tim do you are, are you planning on this is always a dangerous question to ask because it might be a secret but writing anything or putting anything out that would you know uh, nothing on the agenda right now um i played around with that idea for a little while um and uh, i finished my dissertation seven or several years ago now um so now that uh that that uh huge undertaking is done um the writing itch is starting to creep back up a little bit so we'll have to see how god leads on that front yeah have you have you written any journal articles or anything that we could mm -hmm. i mean we'll we'll link to the by faith article but are there is there anything specifically that we can point people to in some of the journals that are out there not um, not from a research perspective yet, but that may be forthcoming. Um, but there is some good work uh, that other folks have done. Um, if people start diving into the faith development side of that peer-reviewed research, just jump on Google Scholar, and um, there'll be some stuff on there that um, I think some folks will like like diving into. Yeah, I've I've got a hunch that you know this is this is a big enough issue. It's it's been slowly developing, but I've got a hunch that there's enough people like you who are out there thinking about this and seeing this really as a matter of faith development and integrating faith in all of life that by and large we've overlooked that uh, there will be more on the, on the horizon coming soon. So so that's good. Good, excellent. Uh, I'll ask you one more question. Do do you folks? Uh, provide any opportunities down there at Covenant for student athletes uh, who are in their middle school or high school years um, to learn? Do you do? We didn't. I didn't ask you about this beforehand, but I'm assuming you folks do camps and things like we that. Do. Or, yeah. Yep. Tell us about that. We do. Yeah. So we camp offerings every summer um, for people to come to campus, and some of them are just fun camps. Um, and then we also have elite camps. We're trying to identify college prospects that we think would be a good fit for our athletic program. So two different kind of tracks there, um, but both are um, led by our same head coaches and full-time assistant coaches. Um, and both are done in a way where we're really trying to integrate the gospel into athletics. We'll also have a fun time playing um, whatever sport someone ends up signing up for. Mm, this is great. Uh, thanks for thanks for doing this. Thanks for thinking about these things and providing us with these resources, especially what we've talked about today. You you've inspired me. I may I may reignite my dream to be a professional baseball player again sometime soon, and you know work on that. I'll have to work on my kickball kicking too. But uh, thanks so much, Tim. And uh, we are going to put uh, your email address. We'll put your social media stuff on there as well. So any parting words for us? Um, just thanks for the opportunity. This is great. Love the work that you guys are doing. Love that you're stepping into the space. I think it's really valued and needed. And um, I appreciate you challenging all of us just to um, take a hold of the culture uh, on behalf of Price. It just um, gets me excited. So thank you for your work. Great. Well, thank you. And I hope you have a great week uh, talking to pastors and, and leaders in the church, because I know that so much of this uh, falls on their shoulders and many of them just don't know what to do. So thanks for thinking about this. Well, everybody, thanks for joining us. And we will talk to you on the next episode next time on Youth Culture Matters. Thanks for joining us for Youth Culture Matters, a podcast from the Center for Parent Youth Understanding. If you'd like to learn more about today's youth culture, visit our website at cpyu.org. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, email us at podcast at cpyu.org. 